If you will, turn your Bibles to Exodus 24. We're going to start there and then in chapter 32. I'm going to preach all seven chapters. No, just kidding. Jamie does a great job reading scripture. Somebody mentioned that. What a voice. The guy has a voice for radio. I've been told I have a face for radio, but you have a voice for radio. Great job with your reading. We are um, at Valley View. I, I want to slow things down, and I, I want to think about how significant next Sunday is when a couple more men agree to choose to lead this church in the eldership. It's not just your casual Sunday where you pick a couple people and pray them in. Uh, but this is one church that I think appreciates just how significant good eldership is. And I think those people who, who have the best idea of what an elder should be are people who've never served as one. It's kind of like parenting. And, uh, and I have strong feelings about what an elder should be and what they should do and how they are. I go to uh, preachers' things and I hear people talk about their elders and, and the things that they do. And I've never once participated in a discussion about how bad elders are. I've never served under a bad elder. That's weird. Because most people have some kind of horror stories about men who were despotic and... and um, just kind of curmudgeon-y people, you know? I, I've never had those stories. I've always been under people who had this great consciousness of what an amazing task they've got. But we're on the cusp of adding a couple new people, and this is a great time in the Valley View history to know that you've got people lining up, and there are so many below uh, these guys who are, are, are too young at this point, but they're, they're doing what they need to be doing right now to one day serve this, and that's a wonderful thing. Tonight, I want to use Use this passage as kind of a, what I would say as, as a preacher who's got an experience with elders and what I would say is, is the most important thing about an elder. It's weird for me to say that, but it reminds me of, uh, I just, I want you to use your memory on this, don't turn there, but in Numbers chapter 12, something really strange happens when Aaron and his sister rise up in complaint over Moses. You know this story? You remember this, right? And they, they said, we, we're, just as God, we're just as important as you are. We've got the Spirit just like you do. We're, we have just as much authority as, as Moses does. And it's just like all of a sudden this is going to their head. And God answers very emphatically, no, you don't. <laughs> he makes it clear. She gets leprosy and he gets reprimanded very sternly by God. What makes it so weird is that Aaron's had a, ten, had a chance to be in, in Moses' spot, and he didn't do so hot. He once had a chance to be in Moses' spot and be the leader, and the situation arose that he could have handled very easily, and he blew it. He made himself look awful. And I would think after this, he would never rise up in defiance again. But here he is in Numbers 12 thinking I'm just as important as you are. It's like the St. Louis Cardinals. I could manage better than Schilt. I'm telling you right now, I could do it. You put me at the helm, they're going to win, and we're going to go to the World Series. Because I know, just come and listen to me at a go-all game, and, and I will manage for you from my lazy boy. Right? I know how leadership is supposed to go. Well, I think, I, I think Aaron kind of fashioned himself as, as good as Moses, and he wasn't. But it's very easy to think you will be when you're not actually there. When it's not your role and you have this evaluation. I think every church leader should look in the mirror once a month and say the next three statements. You ready? Number one, the leader should look in the mirror and say, conflict and stress are not evil. Conflict and stress are not evil. We're easily terrified about the prospect of conflict coming near us. We become nervous. We become uncomfortable. We start imagining the worst. Anxiety rises within us. And we start reaching for the quick, easy solution because this is uncomfortable. And we have this idea that peace is to be had and maintained at all costs. And that is not true. 
peace is not our highest value in the church. Conflict is a time to reinforce your truth and define yourself. In Acts, when the church experienced conflict, they got together and they handled it properly. And the church grew as a result. And people understood the nature of the church based on how they handled the conflict that arose. It is inevitable and it is healthy for a church to have conflict. It's a chance to respond to a situation by trusting in God's truth come what may. So an elder must look, or a leader in any position must look in the mirror and say, conflict is not evil and bad. Secondly, the leader looks into the mirror and says, it could be a leader of a family, or, but I'm thinking of elders now, I do not have to react quickly. We want to quickly restore equilibrium. We want to eliminate all complaint immediately. I want to respond fast and show that I'm decisive, right? This is much for the anxiety of the person who presents the issue as it is for me. But we have a tendency to absorb the anxiety of the people around us. We start demanding a resolution as quickly as they want one. And that makes us prone to giving them exactly what they want. We accept their interpretation as the right one and we also accept their solution as the right one. And if you give them what they want without thinking of it, you might alleviate the tension. It might look heroic and wise and decisive until you realize that that wasn't your place and it wasn't as wholesome as you think. Listen to this proverb. Proverb 18, 17. The one who states his case first seems right until another comes and examines him. The first one who tells me their side of the story, well, of course that's the way to see it. Obviously that's right. And then the other side gives their story, and you're going, ooh, this isn't as easy as I thought. It's amazing. You don't have to react quickly. And here's a third one. Look in the mirror. Conflict and stress are not evil. I do not have to act or react quickly. Third, I do not have to do this alone. The fact that the issue came to you does not mean it's your responsibility to fix it. Many leaders think that the reason I'm a leader is, is because of this, to decide these kinds of things, to solve things like this. But you forget in the church there's a reason we have plurality of leaders. God designed the leadership in the church to be efficient, not to be efficient, but to be effective. Do you know the difference? People want a senior pastor to be efficient. One person I go to and get an answer like this. We do not have senior pastors. We have plurality of elders. It requires them to get together and discuss it. And that leads to the classic problem. The elders take forever to make any decisions. Yes, by the design of God. He will not let you unilaterally make a decision to resolve all these things. You've got to meet together. You've got to get those guys together. There used to be 10. I've whittled it down to six, y'all. There's six elders left. We're going to add two more. We've got to get eight people together to have some conversation. And that takes time and that allows there to be distance and cooling and a real discussion of this issue. God designed it this way. He's brilliant. And that annoys the efficient world that we live in. God's not as concerned about efficiency as you are, but he is concerned about effectiveness. And that's why he did it this way. Now, what's this got to do with our story? We're in Exodus chapter 24. We've been through a certain part of this as, these, uh, as Moses takes Aaron and her and 70 elders and they go up on the side of the mountain. They have a feast with God. They meet with the Lord. It's an amazing thing. They see the God of Israel. You see that in verse 10. Then the Lord says in verse 12, if you'll join me there in Exodus chapter 24, the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there that I may give you the tablets of stone, the first set with the law and the commandments that I've written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God, Sinai or Horeb, either one. And, the, and he said to the elders, wait here for us 
until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Now, do you get this? He leaves behind 70 elders, Aaron and her. They take care of things while Moses goes on up to the top of the mountain and meets with God to get the Ten Commandments. Joshua goes about halfway up. He's kind of this weird runner guy. And he's up there the whole time too. For 40 days and 40 nights, we see at the end of chapter 24, Moses stays up there. That's a long time. During this time, he gets all these instructions for the tabernacle and all that stuff. And yada, yada. This is where you yawn off a little bit, if you hadn't already. We get to chapter 34 now. Sorry, it's 32. We get to chapter 32. It's still during this 40 days Moses is up there. And they're getting a little antsy. And they just got a little bit confused and a little bit scared because they don't have the visible leadership of Moses standing there. And the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain. The people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said, Make us gods to go before us. As for this man Moses, the man who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. And just like that, they get themselves in trouble. Here is where Aaron gets to stand in for Moses. The day that Aaron stood in for Moses. A chance to show his leadership. And what does he do? Immediately when he hears their complaint and sees the anxiety that's on them, he absorbs it. He takes it on himself. And what does he do? He says immediately, take off all your earrings, take all your stuff, throw them in the fire. And he fashions this, this calf and he builds this calf and he says, he doesn't say these are different gods. He says, here's Yahweh. Here's the God who led you up out of Egypt. Gods who led you up out of Egypt. And just like that, the man who looks at Moses, I can do just as good as you are, he blows it big time. It's so embarrassing. And what's even worse, if you look at chapter 32, verse 24, when Moses says, what in the world did you do, Aaron? And here's what he said. They said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. So far, so good. As for this Moses, the man who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. So I said to them, let any one of you have gold, take it off. They gave it to me. I threw it in the fire and poof, out came a calf. Miracle of miracles. That is the most bizarre and stupid explanation I've ever... And there's going to be people come out, you shouldn't say stupid. I'm going to tell you something. That's stupid. That is absolutely ridiculous. And every preacher who's ever preached on this text rightly observes this is absurd. And if you'll notice at the end of the chapter, or at the end of this particular paragraph, where is it? It says in verse 35, The Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. It's the calf Aaron made. Nobody buys this bizarre explanation he gives. What in the world happened to Aaron? Why in the world did he so quickly give in to the preposterous and obviously wrong suggestion of these people? What in the world? There were people, it says, surely several vocal, strong-willed people who came to him intense with anxiety and nervous about being on their own for a while in this 40 days. And instead of him being a differentiated person, instead of being his own, he absorbed their anxiety. And not only did he absorb their anxiety, but he accepted their solution for it. Yes, by all means we'll do this to calm you down. <clears throat> greatest mistake leaders make is when they absorb the anxiety of the people around them because you immediately also accept their interpretation and you want to resolve it quickly so you give them what they want and it was wrong leaders experience this all the time today let me give you a few of these, <coughs> excuse me, that you'll hear. The church is losing its young people. 
My kids are going around messing with different religious ideas and we've got to do something to keep this generation. I think I've got an idea. We have to do something now or we'll lose the whole generation and they've got you concerned and they've got you whipped into a frenzy and you observe it and you say, yes, we're losing a bunch <coughs> excuse me, of young people. What are we going to do? And they come up with all sorts of knee-jerk, desperate things the church should do to entertain and keep our young people. <coughs> and churches have done this. They've gone on the wrong path out of a feel of anxiety of parents about their young people. Here's another one. A man in a stressful marriage comes in to discuss with the preacher his story and he presents his story in such a compelling way that his desire to leave his spouse really does sound like the only solution to bring any peace to his life. And we find ourselves as preachers endorsing an action that clearly goes against Scripture to calm him because we absorb his anxiety. Or... A member with a lot of debt and it's on the rise. There's a deadline coming for power being shut off two hours away. The only proper thing is for the church to loan me money to keep my power on. What are you going to do about it? Because I'm got, it's going to happen in my kids. And the intensity of the anxiety becomes the leverage they have to make you do something that may not be in the best interest of the person. These are not on level with what Aaron did, but they're born from the same thing. So I want to pause here and clarify something. Yes, we experience empathy. I weep with those who weep and I grieve with those who grieve and I rejoice with those who rejoice. But I do not have to take on the anxiety of the most anxious people. And if you come and you're anxious and I don't act as equally anxious as you are, it's because I'm going to act with principle and I'm not going to take on your situation in the same intensity to make me accept your resolution without thinking about it. What should Aaron have done? First, he should have reminded himself that conflict and stress are not evil. That's what I said before. This is a time to teach people patience and perseverance and total commitment to the first three commandments. He should have said this, Moses will come back. His last words were to me were to wait. And that's exactly what we're going to do. It's a powerful opportunity to teach people the commitment to the truth sometimes is hard. Sometimes is excruciating to wait doing the right thing. But it is always the right thing. It's never the wrong thing. It's never the right thing to do the wrong thing, right? It's never, ever, ever the wrong thing to do the right thing. Until we establish that we are going to stand on the truth in the most stressful moments of our lives, we haven't really established truth. So conflict becomes this beautiful opportunity. We are going to believe this and we are going to do this. And if the rest of the world looks at us as fools and says, if you hold that stance, if you hold this stance, you're going to lose people. You're going to become irrelevant and the world's going to look at you like a bunch of fools. So be it. That's where we stand. It's the truth of God. That's what you have to do. And we are in an age where there's a lot of things that are like that and presented to us that way. And we have to say, you know what? There are some things that are a little fuzzy and I can see some reasoning with, but there are some things that are crystal clear that we can't move. And those things we stand on no matter how unpopular they become. And so Aaron should have said to them, I know it's stressful and I know you're anxious and I know he's been gone for a long time and I don't know how much longer he'll be gone, but I know this, we're going to wait. We're not going to do anything rash like this. Conflict is this chance to really prove you really believe what you really say. Because if you won't believe it in stressful times, you don't really believe it. Second, he should have said to himself, I don't have to react quickly to this. He should have listened patiently and kindly to this group of people. And the way it's always presented is you've got two or three and there's a whole bunch of people saying this. There's a whole bunch of people, not just us. There's a whole bunch of people saying this. And because of the population of the complaint, it has a little bit weightier thing. At least it's supposed to. But a soft answer can turn away anxiety. He should have issued himself a gag order. 
on any proposals for a period of time. Do not react quickly. Instead, respond thoughtfully. A great case in point is Acts chapter 6 when there's this horrendous moment. It's a really an ethnic problem. You've got these old family Jews who are now Christians, who are, uh, who are widows, and they're being taken care of with a daily distribution of food. But there's some of these younger widows who are more Hellenized, which means they speak Greek and they're a little more progressive. Not theologically, but just in their lives. And all of a sudden, the Hebraic Jews, widows, are being taken care of just fine. But some of these Greek-speaking, progressive, living Jews are being slighted. It's... It's prejudice. And the complaint comes up and the, and the apostles hear it. And there's no book, chapter, and verse for what do you do with a bunch of widows having a fight. I don't know where there's any kind of verse like this. And they're just like, I'm not sure what to do about this. They get together. They get together and they say, well, here's what we got to do. we got to put some men over this, some godly spiritual men to be over this. And they're going to want, but we can't give up the, the, the ministry of the word of God and prayer. And so we're going to put some spiritual men over this and they're going to resolve this. And they resolved it. And they did beautiful. And the church grew as a result. we given another number tag at the end of that. Now, I know this situation with Aaron was intense. All these people coming up and they're all anxious and they're all worried and they're going to peer pressure him into something. But the right answer was really rather clear, wasn't it? What should Aaron have done? Well, I know building a golden calf is the wrong answer, don't you? I know that. What made the wrong answer seem like the right one? What made the clear right answer not so clear? And the answer is this, acting rashly. This solves things seemingly immediately. Let's do it real fast. And so we rush into something and we realize we've done the obviously wrong thing, but we've done it quickly and we've satisfied these people and it seems okay and it creates a mess. Here's a third thing Aaron should have said. I do not have to do this by myself. God, uh, Moses, I should say, did not leave Aaron in charge alone. He left Aaron and her and 70 elders in charge until he returned. And there's his excuse. He should have said to them, let me get with the 71 others in this interim leadership team and we will think about this. I think God intended our eldership to be a way out for us. And certainly for one elder, one part, all these people come to one elder and say, you've got to solve this, and, and the pressure's building, and he's got a cop-out. He's got a built-in cop-out. I think God designed it this way. I tell you what, I've got to get with the other seven. And after I get with the other seven, we will think about this. It gives you a time out. Time out. It gives you a chance to, in the give and take and the, and, the, and the company of other godly people to come up with a better solution. This is why we have elderships. And you might be annoyed at how long it takes. But I would rather act correctly than to act quickly, wouldn't you? I would much rather know I'm doing the right thing than the fast thing. And here again is where Hebrews 13 comes in. Submit to your leaders so that their job can be more of a joy. You'll never be privy to all that the elders think about or have to decide upon. And there will be issues that sound to you so very simple. And the action is crystal clear. Any dummy can see this, but you don't know what they know and they can never tell you. And they're stuck. They're stuck with a group of people who are in a spot where they could easily judge them for being foolish. But what you don't know are the other facts that you don't know and they can never share. <coughs> You've got a choice. <coughs> You can rant about it, and you can undermine them, and you can bad talk about them, and think about how, how, how they did something so foolish, or, or instead you can trust them. And the whole reason we choose elders the way we choose them 
is because everybody has a chance to say, I don't want to serve under them. I don't want to be here as a sheep under that shepherd. I do not trust that my best interest is at their heart. And so you've had a couple of weeks to complain. And I, I get the impression that nobody has a complaint about these two guys, much less the other six who serve. And you're going to trust them. And there are going to be moments in the future. Mark my words. Mark this sermon. Get this CD for later. There's going to be moments when you will be baffled at what they do. And they will make mistakes. And when they do, they will tell you. But sometimes they do what they do because they know more than you. And they can never tell you. And so far as I've seen with these guys that serve here, you'll never, ever know. Leadership is extremely challenging. It's easier to evaluate it than it is to provide it. But even if you're not an official leader in various settings, you will be put into a position to feel the anxiety of others. Parents are put in this position all the time. Your kid comes to you with three of their best friends wanting to do something you know is not good for them. And they use peer pressure against you. Forget what they're under. They're putting it on you. You're going to have to absorb the anxiety of other people. You're going to be in Aaron's position at various times in your life. Before that happens, before it happens, program this into your heart. Conflict and stress are not evil. It's a chance for us to define what church and family and truth is. Second, you do not have to react quickly. Your kids will try to do that to you too. You've got to have an answer in the next three seconds. And you do not have to do this alone. You're going to have times to appreciate where Aaron was led to fail. But you won't have to follow suit. You can be empowered to respond differently because he models for you what he should have done. So next week, two new men will be installed with the other six. And I think you've got some solid leadership for many years in the future. You can be confident these men will do this. They're not going to absorb your anxiety. They're going to act out of principle. Respect them for it. Be ready for it. And they're going to love you just like the others do. You have a great leadership team at this church. And you can be thankful for that. And you can trust them. And even when you can't understand them, you can trust them. God's been good to Valley View and he's going to continue being good as we try, strive and really try to be as holy as we can in the things that we do. If there's anyone here this evening who stands ready to respond to the gospel call, it always goes out. You want to be a child of God and you want to be a sheep under the oversight of these shepherds here, you've got to be sheep under Christ first. And that means confessing His name, repenting of your sin, being immersed. And then you try to live your life the best you can. And the beautiful thing of that is you're put into a family like this who are looking after each other. And this evening, if the invitation is appropriate for you, and you sense the need to answer it, we stand ready to receive you as we stand and sing together. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without.